Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's my pleasure to welcome everybody here today to the Public Policy Institute of California, the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, and California Water Service uh, discussion from droughts to floods, water in Silicon Valley. Um, I thought I would start with a true story uh, shortly after. Governor Brown was uh, elected uh, back to the governor's job. I was back in New York meeting with an institutional money investor. And the uh, institutional money investor said, you know, Marty, what changes in California? You still have fires, you still have floods, you still have earthquakes, and you still have Jerry Brown as governor. <laughs> and uh, the, the point he was trying to make was um, the drought back in the mid-70s when uh, Jerry Brown was governor to the drought that we have now. And um, the perceptions from Wall Street outside the state are really different than what the facts are kind of inside the state. And as I talked to this individual, it was very clear that there were some disconnects. I, uh, I had the pleasure of working with Governor Brown when he was mayor of Oakland. And uh, if you talk to anyone in Oakland, uh, regardless of their political affiliation, they tend to speak very highly of the governor because of his good work that he's done in terms of uh, creating a lot of value for the city uh, and a lot of the projects that he did. So I got to work with him on some of the solar initiatives and uh, found him to be very pragmatic, very focused, uh, and very dedicated and driven to his cause. Um, the simple fact is uh, California is an economic powerhouse, and if you look at the uh, $2 trillion of GDP that the state produces, if you, which equals 13% of the U.S. total GDP gross domestic product, uh, the agribusiness in the state of California is more than double of any other state in the union. And people tend to not dissect these points. And these, the debate around the drought seems to evolve between the uh, fight between urban and ag. And the fact is the two groups need to work together. If you On the urban side, if you look at the population growth since the last major drought in the 70s, uh, our population growth has soared over 38 million people in the state, which is a growth rate of 69% since 1976, which is pretty incredible if you think about it. If you look at the change in population since the majority of the state's infrastructure, water infrastructure, was put into place um, by Jerry Brown's father, uh, Pat Brown, which is, uh, and most of that infrastructure was put in place in the 50s and 60s, the population growth is 245%, which is pretty staggering. So as an economist, when I look at social economic problems, and water can easily become a social economic problem, I like to pick things apart and analyze the inputs. And so you've had you know, a massive agribusiness that has grown to be the, the biggest ag business in the US. At the same time, you've had the fastest growing population of a state growing. So you've created this urban water demand and this agricultural water demand. And the fact is, both sides need water. And uh, our timing's pretty incredible with Earth Week and with the governor's declaration a couple weeks ago, and we're, we're busy working to put our drought plans together. And so today we find ourselves in an unprecedented drought, the worst drought in, in, this, in the history of the state of California. And uh, as a result, we have a water bond that was passed last fall, which is important. And I believe the silver lining, and, and Ellen and I were just talking about this, is it, it the drought's causing discussion, and I think discussions like this become really important because we have to get to a solution that lasts for the long term. Uh, here at California Water Service Group, we were the first uh, investor-owned water utility to decouple sales from revenue, and we did that in 2008. And uh, as a company, we felt that was really important because not being decoupled, we didn't have the incentive to promote conservation. And since 2008, we've had the largest conservation budget of an investor-owned water utility in North America. And so from our perspective, um, our customers are in good shape going into this, this, uh, this unprecedented drought in terms of being prepared for it. And so we feel like we've, we've been in a good position to help our customers succeed. California Water Service Company, which is the California utility, serves 2 million people as far north as Chico and as far south as uh, Palos Verdes in, in Southern California. Uh, we're a leader in conservation. Uh, Ken, if you can stand up, Ken in the back. If you want to know anything about conservation, uh, Ken is our, is our guy on conservation. He gets a lot of speaking uh, engagements and he spends a lot of time talking to customers about what they can do in cities to, to help lower their demand. Uh, accordingly, we're, uh, we're very proud to be here today hosting the event, and it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Ellen Hayek, who's going to take it from here from the Public Policy Institute of California. Ellen? Thank you very much, Marty. And I also want to shout out to, to Mike Mielke, whom you're going to get to hear from later. Um, it's, it's really been a, a pleasure for, for us at PPIC 
uh, to be able to, to work with Cal Water and the Silicon Valley Leadership Group to, to put together this event. And this is really one of the first of many of what we hope are going to be interesting, stimulating conversations that, that we work to to hold together with local and regional partners around the state as part of getting more people engaged in thinking about California's water future. And so thank you for thank you for being the, the host of the first one of those. PPIC just launched a water policy center back on the day after the governor made his emergency declaration. Uh, um, we, we, we planned on April 2nd um, not thinking that he was going to do that, but that ended up um, making the interest and attention on water even more, even greater than it had been over this past year of, of drought. And so um, it's been a, a really good opportunity to have conversations with people about sort of what are the facts, what do we need to know, what can we do to, to, to really solve this, this big challenge that, that we're facing in, in California. So I'm very happy to be able to kick off what's going to be a great, great uh, set of discussions with a distinguished group of, of speakers. And my job is to give you kind of a the, the sort of quick overview um, before we dig in with the with the real experts who can, who can dig in on the big issues for you. Um, so we talked about sort of the fact that, yes, everybody's interested in the drought, but we shouldn't forget that floods are also a reality and kind of the, the flip side of the coin of the, the kind of variable climate that California has. And in the Silicon Valley area, uh, that's, a, that's an important challenge too. So I just want to touch on that as we're, as we're thinking about droughts. Um, and so just to, to sort of remind you of, of the, the sort of big picture on our climate, this is looking back, as long as the historical record exists, this is average precipitation statewide. And what we've highlighted there are the, blue, the dark blue are dry years and the, the rest are normal or wet years. If we had used a third color, you would have seen more, more clearly some of those spikes that are, that are pretty high up there too. Those are, those are the, the, the really wet years are years where we've tended to get pretty bad floods. And in fact, the, the three biggest ones have been in the, since, the, since the early 80s. So in addition to droughts becoming a, 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 a bigger and bigger preoccupation for, for California water management, um, floods are also something we have to think about. And it is true that this is a big drought. There's debate over whether it's the worst ever or not, and you'll find different journal articles using different techniques to tell you yes it is or, or, or it isn't. What is clear is that uh, we are in the fourth year of what may not be the fourth year, the, may not be the last year of, of a big drought, and it's been officially an emergency uh, in, the, in the state since January of 2014, and we are, as Marty said, facing the need to deal with this challenge with a much bigger population than the last major drought um, that we had. And we're needing to face it in the context of a climate that is changing and warming. Um, so th what this graph on the, on the left shows you is average temperature in California. And temperatures have been increasing in the state as they have in general planet-wide um, over, over time over the last century, and it's gotten really hot in California over the last couple years. And if you add heat to a drought, that just intensifies the drought because it dries out the moisture in the soils. And so it actually means that any irrigation needs that you might have are higher uh, in order to give the, keep the plant in the same condition of health because the soil is not providing that moisture. Um, the nice map that you see there just points to one of the other concerns with climate change and what we're going to have to be preparing for in the Bay Area as well as in California and, and beyond. And this one, this one shows you in particular that the dark part, the dark blue, is the part of the Bay that is the Bay now that um, will, sorry, the part of the Bay that is land now that if we don't do anything to hold the water back with projections of sea level rise for th this century would actually become bay. 
Now some of that used to be bay before and we filled the land in um, and you know that's the, because it was pretty shallow and, and it's shallow in the other direction too. So the bay wants to be expanding with sea level rise and there are a couple factors to think about there. One is just sort of the slowly creeping average levels that can, can cause some management challenges for places like wastewater treatment plants that are built with gravity in mind and you know at a certain point that's not going to be feasible to do that without changing the way that, that, that those systems work. But the other thing is that as the sea level goes up, you got storm surges that are bigger and more frequent, and and they just make make a big big management challenge. And there are parts of the bay where this is going to happen, where it's really just kind of undeveloped land still, with some places up in the in the North Bay in the Marin area. Um, but there are places where there are a lot of houses and people and, and businesses. And there's a map that some of you may have seen that just focuses down on Silicon Valley that shows you actually the icons of many of the important companies of this region that are in that area that that is in the dark blue and that would become bay again if uh, if something's not done to, to to change the the flood protection so continuing on climate change and thinking about that you know, I mentioned how it's been been really warm it's been dry it's been warm we've had some record breaking um, aspects in in, in various various aspects of the characteristics of this drought. I think the one that there's no debate about at all is that the snowpack is lowest, lowest, lowest ever on record. 5% of average, which is really low, and it's actually lower than the model projections of what normal will be like at the end of the century uh, with, with climate warming. So you can see Governor Brown standing um, in a mountain meadow up in, in the Sierras on April 1st, and as uh, those of you who heard him talk about it, he said, I should be standing on five feet of snow. That would have been the normal. So what that does is it just makes the management of this drought harder because we don't, normally we have free snowpack storage um, in California, and that is a big source of water for our summer irrigation needs when we always need irrigation because we don't normally get rain in the summer. And this year, management is gonna be tougher because that snowpack is not there. So, Marty mentioned a little bit the debates about the, the, the fighting that's kind of started uh, um, as, as the governor's announcement of mandatory cutbacks in the urban sector um, happened as part of his April 1st announcement. So a lot of newspapers talking about who uses how much water. Some of you may have heard that farms use 80%. Some of you may have heard that farms use 40%. Both are right. It's just different pies that people are talking about. The total pie that the Department of Water Resources measures, and they do this, they've been doing it with actual annual measurements since 1998. There's always a lag. So the last year for which we actually have the detailed data is 2010. So this shows you the average over that 1998 to 2010 period. The department allocates some, accounts some water for the environment, and I'll describe that in a minute and then the water used by farms and the water used by cities and, and suburbs. This is the, the total average. So about half of that pie goes to the environment. Over half of that environmental slice is water in the North Coast rivers, which are really kind of not connected to the rest of the system. Those, are, those were declared wild and scenic under Ronald, Ronald Reagan's governance, governance in the 1970s. And then the rest of environmental water, um, some of it is for salinity control, some of it is for protecting species that are um, endangered or you know, at, at risk of extinction, and some of it is for wetlands for, for birds. Um, some of that gets reused by people, some of it doesn't. There's competition over some of it, but actually the competition is over a pretty small slice relative to that total pie. Um, so cities use about 10% of the total or 20% or of what people use. Uh, it's an ur urban economy now in California, so the, that's one of the reasons why a drought is not as, well, it does not make California's economy as vulnerable as one might have imagined. Farms need the water in order to grow stuff. It is a very productive agricultural sector. We've got about nine million acres of irrigated cropland, typically. Farmers had to cut back about a half a million uh, acres of cropland last year because of, because of cutbacks in their supply. Um, the farm economy is about 2% of California's total economy, but that's because agriculture in general in the modern US economy is not 
just a big dollars and cents piece of the economy, but it's obviously a vital part of the economy. Um, as we all know, we all eat. Um, so uh, that, that debate has been probably more heat than light, I think. And it's just, these are just kind of facts about, about who uses the water. Um, I will say about the ecosystems that they have been taking a bigger cut than anybody else uh, in, the, in this drought. And there's a, a really some, some difficult performance uh, issues now with, with some, some fish really borderline extinction. Um, and that's despite a lot of efforts to, to, to manage this carefully. So droughts have silver linings. And I, I agree with that statement that, that Marty said. And, and I think you know, it, it's, there are opportunities for us to take stock and see what we need to do to, to get better. And the good news with this drought is that our urban areas are in much better shape than they were in the last long drought, which was from the late 80s through the early 90s. And that's thanks to a lot of investments in drought planning and, and preparation. The bad news is the farm sector has been taking a hit. Some small communities have been, been really having emergency supply needs, and there's this environmental water, water crisis that I mentioned. Now, Governor called for mandatory conservation statewide of 25%. I think we'll get a chance to hear about, more about that in the discussions that follow me. The Bay Area can kind of feel good that we don't use a lot of water compared to some other places, but we could still, uh, we could still do better. And a lot of that better has to do with outdoor water use. Because statewide, we use about half of our urban water outdoors. That's true um, to a less, as it's smaller in some coastal communities than half, but there's still a lot of potential for, for savings there. And that's through various kinds of innovation, including landscape changes and using, using things besides uh, cool season turf grass. So innovation was one of the themes that we wanted to kind of highlight in this conference, that really this is a, a, a problem that needs a lot of creative collective thinking. We need innovation to diversify water supplies with things like recycled water, capturing storm water, desal in some places, to, to decrease demand. And that's by sending people, giving people good information and, and helping with efficiency. Institutions need to change sometimes to be able to do some of this, modernizing our codes, our plumbing codes, our building codes. So just a question for you to think about is how can Silicon Valley help with that? And then just last slide to show you public opinion, which PPIC surveys on a regular basis to show you how much the public is interested in this. This is a question that just asks people open-ended what they see as the state's top issue. And you can see over the time that the drought has been in effect that that has really skyrocketed. By the end of last year, it was way up where statewide, um, the water and drought were on par with jobs in the economy, which are almost always top, top, top issue. This is, I guess, from March, our, our, our latest survey. But that, that's been sort of true since October, September, October. And the Bay Area, where the economy is doing pretty good compared to the state, um, you can see that 32% that of people think this is the top issue, which means I think that there's possibility for really getting people behind some, some reforms and some change. And with that, I'm going to show you one of the solutions that a mission, mission uh, district bar is suggesting uh, for, the, for getting water use down. It has to be imported whiskey, though, I think. Right? <laughs> so, OK, thank you very much. And with that, I see that our distinguished guest, the mayor of San Jose, is here, Sam Licardo. So I'm going to ask him to come up. And our distinguished moderator of the rest of this session, Paul Rogers, who is a a uh, journalist, award-winning journalist on the drought, actually, um, with the Mercury News and with KQED. Please come up, both of you. And thanks so much. Thank you. San Jose is the biggest city in Northern California. And uh, I think a lot of people are looking to San Jose for, for direction around the state. What is, uh, what is the city doing to address the drought? Well, uh, like so many cities, we've set conservation targets. And uh, now, of course, we're being told by the state we'd better set conservation targets or else. And you know, the Water District really led the way. I see Dick Santos is here you know, urging cities to take a 30% conservation uh, target, which is what we've just done last week. Uh, and that will include uh, mandatory restrictions on, for example, watering outdoors two days a week uh, max. Uh, no new poles, uh, no new landscaping that's not drought tolerant or, or using drip irrigation, those kinds of basic conservation measures. In addition, I think we have some opportunities to do some more innovative things around, uh, for example, uh, we're trying to launch a, a summer jobs program, which we'll be doing uh, this summer, engaging over 800 teens, 
primarily in gang impacted areas in summer jobs. Uh, we want to get them involved in water conservation, and so we are putting together a, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, a water core of uh, teens who are going to be tearing out lawns for homeowners like myself who are eager to rip them up uh, and uh, helping those teens get employed. And we're working on some private public partnerships to help pay for that. So uh, I look forward to making that happen and hopefully increasing sort of the, the awareness, particularly among our young folks, of, of what we can do. And those new rules that you mentioned, they take effect immediately, right? Yeah, they do. It's an urgency measure, so uh, good time to adjust the sprinklers. And there are going to be fines for violators, I'm told. Uh, yes, there are. And enforcement, of course, is a challenge uh, because uh, the Water District isn't empowered to enforce, and we are, uh, are challenged constantly with our budget. And so we're going to be talking a bit about uh, how and, and if we enforce particular uh, provisions. I think there's no question we want to. The question is how we do it. I think the reality is, uh, you know, the way that, for example, Santa Cruz has imposed penalties uh, for excessive water use is probably the most feasible or viable mechanism for enforcement. That is through the price mechanism. When it hits you in your wallet, uh, you do change your behavior. And I think that's where we are going to be urging um, our retailing and uh, wholesale water community to go with us. Let's talk about uh, last year. Uh, Governor Brown in January of 2014 uh, declared a drought emergency, as, as Ellen mentioned, and he asked uh, everybody in the state for a voluntary 20% reduction. Uh, statewide, California responded with a 9% reduction. Um, San Jose did a little better. San Jose was 11%. Um, why didn't San Jose hit the target? We tried, Paul. We really did. Uh, no, we, we obviously, uh, we have a lot of residents who want to do their part, and we also went through a heat spell. Uh, that I knew that, that I know, particularly in, in the winter time when we didn't expect such a, a warm winter, uh, that certainly uh, pulled a lot of folks off their targets. But we know we can do better, and uh, we didn't hit the target of 20%. That's one reason why I want to really hit the stretch goal at 30 uh, to give us a little cushion before those $10,000 a day fines start rolling in. <laughs> right, right. From the state. I'm sure you have other ways you'd rather spend that money. I sure do. <laughs> yes. Um, in the years ahead, uh, what do you see the city's role? You know, here we are in the, in the center of Silicon Valley, the, 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 the center of uh, innovation in, in the world. What do you see the role of the city in facilitating sort of non-traditional solutions uh, to drought, such as recycled water, stormwater capture, you know, uh, changing city plumbing codes, th those types of things? Well, I think a lot of folks in this room know we've been uh, pushing hard on and recycle water system now for many, many years. We now recycle well 14 million gallons a day through our water pollution control plant. And we have South Bay water recycling system, 142 miles of purple pipe. Um, the next step in the water district has been planning for this for many years. And I think we're really ready to take the job is for groundwater recharge, to take the recycled water, put it back into our underground aquifers through perk ponds, different areas in the valley. That's going to take some capital infrastructure, certainly, and uh, we know the district is, is going to be integral in all of that. It also takes, I think, some uh, civic leadership on the city side uh, because toilet to tap doesn't always sell well, uh, and we know we have to overcome that ick factor, and that requires, I think, some leadership to get there. Uh, what we're going to be announcing next week, uh, and really grateful for the leadership of Senator Jim Bell who took this up, uh, we're really trying to push this, uh, the construction of a indirect potable reuse system as quickly as possible. We think if all goes well, if we can get through CEQA in an accelerated way, we could get into the first phase of an IPR system in, in as little as 24 months, uh, which would be a great opportunity for us, but we've got to get the state out of the way. And uh, I know we all love CEQA, and sometimes we don't love CEQA. In this case, I'm less in love with CEQA because this could be a huge impediment for us to implement this. So. With uh, Senator Bell's leadership, we're asking for either an exemption or a very streamlined process to get through CEQA so we can get uh, the pipes built so we can get down to the Ford uh, percolation ponds in the south part of the, the city. Now, um, do, do you know, and I, I don't know this, and, and if you don't, that's fine too, but do there still need to be some changes to the public health codes from the state water board for cities to be able to do that? Or do you know if... If all those I's are dotted and T's crossed, I, I know we do need that. authorization and permit from the state. But I do know that other jurisdictions, for example, in Orange County uh, yeah. and L.A. now is, is pushing forward. So Orange County has been doing it, of course, for many years. So uh, I would imagine the law allows it. But either way, we do need authorization from the state. Got it. Uh, whenever 
we publish stories in the Mercury News uh, or air stories on KQED radio or TV about the drought, uh, we always get uh, members of the public, uh, they have all kinds of creative ideas, you know, building pipelines from Canada and towing icebergs and all sorts of things, um, <laughs> which are uh, uh, quite costly uh, that oftentimes they, they may not realize. But one of, the, one of the questions that does come up a lot is um, why does San Jose and other cities continue to allow new development? You know, I, I commonly get these emails saying, look, they're putting up giant condo centers uh, in yeah. San Jose. If this is so bad, why are you allowing that? Yeah. Uh, what, would, what would you tell those folks? Well, you know, halting growth in a city like San Jose is a little bit like Canute ordering back the sea. Uh, it's just not going to happen in a place. Uh, well, I can tell you for a few reasons. One, the state law prohibits us from halting uh, development, particularly housing development. Uh, there is a presumption that every city needs to do its part to accommodate people who are working there, uh, and that means we need to have the housing for them. Uh, it's also the case that not all housing is created equally with regard to water consumption. We know, as you all know, uh, half or more of our water consumption residential uses in our yards. And the advantage of building high-rise housing is that nobody's watering their petunias, uh, well, at least not outdoors. So, so we really see dramatically less water consumption with very high-density transit-oriented development that we're pushing hard in this city as you see cranes over the the air in our downtown, uh, we are going to be doing more of that. You'll see more of those cranes. And we've got a very strong general plan that strongly discourages building out in the, into the hillsides and in places where you're likely to see higher per capita consumption. And I guess a lot of those newer buildings have recycled water plumbing into the toilets and things like the 49er Stadium does, for example. Yeah, when they're within spitting distance of the purple pipe, that has been uh, often a standard. Now, I got to say, that's, I don't think that's going to be our future. Uh, purple pipe, wonderful system, but very expensive. And I think it's, you know, the district prepared a report uh, a while ago indicating it's well over uh, $40 million a year just to have a reliable, I'm sorry, over five years, just to really maintain the reliability of that system. So I think the future for us is having one integrated system that is with groundwater recharge rather than continue to build out um, the purple pipe as an alternative. Interesting. I think we have time for one, for one more question. Um, as Ellen said, we don't know for sure that this drought is going to end with a nice soaking rain this winter. I think a lot of folks who run city water departments around the state and water districts were hoping that the solution to the drought was going to come this winter, and it didn't. And Australia just had a drought that lasted more than 10 years. Uh, I've written about droughts in the historic record in California that lasted 100 years. We had two droughts that lasted 100 years or more between 800 and 1000 AD and 1100 and 1300 AD. Um, and we've also had several that have lasted 20 years or more. So Aren't we glad we're not alive then? Absolutely. <laughs> and you know, the scary thing is that within California's 165 year history, the longest drought we've ever had is six years. And a lot of climatologists think that this century is one of the wettest centuries over the last three or 4,000 years. And that's what we've built our entire civilization, Silicon Valley, Hollywood, you know, this ag economy on. And, I, I, you know, not to be the, the downer here, but I'm just curious if you have any thoughts. <laughs> uh, if, if this drought... That'll could, make you drink whiskey. Just drink <laughs> there you go. <laughs> if this drought would continue, you know, for, for another year or two or three yeah. or five, I mean, what, what, what do you think the city's plans would be? I mean, what would that look like? We've got the tugboats ready to go to get the icebergs. Uh, <laughs> pull them down here. You know, um, the, you know I, I agree. I think you know, we have to think about the possibility that, like the Jack Nicholson film, this may be as good as it gets. Uh, and this may be really the new normal. Um, what Certainly, groundwater recharge is, is one important opportunity for us. We think with full build-out, we can get to 35,000 acre feet a year. That's significant, though obviously doesn't solve the problem magically. Uh, there are certainly lots of folks who are looking at desal and desalination as, a, as an opportunity. Uh, we know it's probably a few years off in terms of cost, energy consumption, environmental impact. They're still working out a lot of bugs there. I'm eager to see us uh, explore it. Though not eager to invest in it right away, uh, as I think it needs a lot of work still. Um, but certainly, we should continue to, to push to see if, if it's viable for us. I know we're seeing more of that down in Southern California. Uh, and uh, frankly, uh, it may simply be a case in which we've got to either be more successful at the state level 
and convincing, uh, well, I guess it would really be both state and federal legislators, uh, that something more than 20% of our water allocation in the state should be for urban areas. Uh, you know, we, we simply can't assume that the future of the state is going to be so dependent on agriculture uh, that we deprive our population of 80% of our water resource. Mm -hmm. Anything else you'd like to add? No, I'm just grateful. I know a lot of people in this room have been working hard on this problem a lot longer than I have. Um, so I'm, I'm certainly very interested in the creative ideas that come from, from uh, the knowledgeable folks uh, out here in our community. We're the most innovative place on the planet. We should be able to figure this one out. Great. Uh, please join me in thanking Mayor Licardo. Thank you. I want to mention how this debate over whether this is the worst drought in, the, in California's history. Uh, one way to put it in perspective in San Jose is that San Jose normally gets 15 inches of rain. That's the historic average in a year. It's the same as Los Angeles, similar number to Fresno. It's also the same amount of rain in a year that Morocco gets. Casablanca, Morocco gets 15 inches of rain a year also. And um, if you do the math, back to 2011, it's been four years, we should have had 60 inches of rain in San Jose during that time. Um, we have had 35 inches of rain. So barely half. So even if this uh, fledgling El Nino that seems to be in constant state of development in the Pacific Ocean comes through in the winter and soaks California, um, we're 25 inches in the hole, almost two years. So we would need 15 inches for a normal year plus 25 more to make up the four-year deficit. So we would need 40 inches of rain in San Jose by this time next year. Um, never in the history of San Jose have we had 40 inches of rain in a year. 1982-83, when we had the worst floods in the city's history, when Alviso was under eight feet of water, we had 30 inches of rain that year. So that shows you, uh, even if we get a really drenching winter, we're not entirely out of the woods. Uh, it's some, some interesting context. It's a very deep hole to get out of. And with that, uh, let me introduce our panel. Um, we have uh, Angela Chung. She is um, the Deputy uh, Operating Officer from the Santa Clara Valley Water District. We have Juliet Christian Smith, who is a climate scientist uh, with the Union of Concerned Scientists here in California. And uh, David Sedlak, who is a professor at the uh, University of California, Berkeley, and is also the co-director of uh, Cal's Berkeley Water Center. Um, they have uh, longer and much more impressive bios than that. Uh, if you'd like to see those, those are in your materials. Um, why don't I get uh, right to the questions? You know, I was just talking about people writing and calling the media about why don't we tell icebergs and things like that. I, I want to ask each of you what you think the main issue is that the public doesn't understand about the drought or that the public is misunderstanding that you want to try to set straight. So uh, maybe we'll uh, start with you, Angela, and come down the line. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I think uh, the, the thing I'm thinking of is not so much a misunderstanding, but more of a lack of an understanding of where the, everybody's water comes from. Uh, I think, you know, here in Silicon Valley, over 50% of our water comes from outside of the county. Since the 1950s, we have, um, even though there were valiant efforts to build uh, dams and reservoirs in the 30s and 50s and recharge ponds and recharging groundwater, by the 50s, we knew that our groundwater table and all the rain that we get, all 15 inches that, that Paul mentioned, they're not enough to really sustain the, the, even the population of the 1950s. So by the 1960s, we contracted with the state water project to bring in state water project into the county. By uh, the 70s, we started pushing towards getting federal central valley water project into the county. In the late 90s, uh, we realized that we need additional diversified portfolio. We contracted with uh, Kern County uh, close to Bakersfield for, to, to bank our excess water that we get from these two allocations and we actually bank up a whole year's worth of water in, the, in that area that we're withdrawing now in the last three years. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, despite a diversified portfolio, which has done us, which has done a great thing in, in the last few years, as the drought drags on, the worry is we're now in the fourth year of a drought and there's no sign of it letting up. What, what happens next? I want to briefly mention that last year, last year we withdraw 25% of our groundwater reserve. And that is significant in that, you know, you think of, you use up, you know, think about the income um, 
example, you use up all your income and you now tap into your bank and you withdraw 25% of that reserve. It's not just the 25%, but it's the fact that the ground that we stand on has, there's a relationship to the ground, between the ground surface and, and groundwater table. So our, our concern is land subsidence in this county. So we want to prevent, um, you know, really withdrawing down to the, to the last drop of water from the ground for, for that reason too. Um, the second thing I just want to very briefly mention, um, I think, you know, our communication tool about conservation hasn't been the greatest. Uh, I'll be the first to admit, when we ask people to cut back 20%, 30%, you know, you go into your household, you think, what am I doing? Am I doing 20%? Um, so fortunately, we talk about technology, we talk about innovation. I know that smart meters are, we can tap into smart meters. So I know that we're partnering with our retailers to start looking at sending out home reports. We want to be able to tell people, in your household in 2013, you used as much water in April of 2013. April of, 2000, uh, April of 2015 here, are you at 12%? Are you at 20%? Are you at 30%? Are you the one that we need to recognize? So we're, we're, we need to go in that direction. Great. Uh, Julia, what would you say is the least understood issue about the drought? Well, I think I, I'm going to pick up on a little bit of where Angela started, which is around where our water comes from. And um, just in the example that you gave, um, really focusing on the rainfall here. But in fact, snowpack is our largest natural water storage system. About a third of California's water comes from snowpack. And the fact that we've received so little snow, record-breaking low, low levels of snow, says volumes about what our future water supply is going to look like next year, even if we had a Noah's Ark-style flood. We don't have that snowpack refilling some of our <coughs> major reservoirs in the Central Valley um, project system and the state water project system. So one of the, the ways that we have traditionally thought about allocating our water resources is looking at reservoir levels. And in fact, uh, about a year and a half ago, Metropolitan Water District of Southern California looked at their reservoir levels and said, hey, we're doing, we're doing pretty well. And they did not require conservation of their retail um, agencies. Now they're in really dire straits. Um, you know, developing tools where we can not only look at current reservoir levels, but understand what our snowpack situation is telling us about how those reservoirs we will refill or not is something that a more climate resilient water system would really be able to do. And there are a host of examples of ways that we, we manage our water system as though we're in a, a historic climate, which of course, as you've always already noted, is, is probably not accurate, even if you took away climate change. Um, and, and so moving forward, we need to think about things like reservoir reoperation. We're, our, we're dumping water out of some of our, our dams during droughts uh, due to really antiquated rules that were meant to protect us from floods, but now we have forecasting capability where we can really understand uh, when we're going to get large precipitation storms coming off the west coast um, and we can do that within about a week's time. NOAA has a, a lot of instrumentation and systems along uh, the north coast of California now. So these are, these are ways where we think and I, I think we've put a lot of money in the state behind understanding how our water system is changing. We have a great um, a semi-annual report that looks at climate impacts and brings together studies throughout California um, about climate change and how it's impacting a, a whole host of resources. But that hasn't always directly informed the way that we're managing our water infrastructure or the way that we're building new water infrastructure. Great. David, you to the same question. Well, I think the main thing, Paul, that the public doesn't understand is that uh, they think that some people think that this is a problem we don't know how to solve. Mm -hmm. And it is a problem that we fundamentally do know how to solve. And I think the mayor hit it, the nail on the head that, that we are undergoing a water revolution where we're changing our water systems from um, a system that relied heavily on imported water and the rain that fell from the sky. And we're implementing technologies that will get us to a place where we won't be as affected by these periodic droughts and climate change. <coughs> And the other thing that the public doesn't fully understand is that sometimes they think that conservation alone is the answer to this problem. Conservation 
is the way that we're going to buy ourselves a few years to really build the future water system that we need. So if we can reduce our water use by 25%, that gives us some lead-in time that as population grows and water demand comes back, we can start building this water infrastructure that we need to get us through the next century. And that's an investment that, I mean, 24 months to build the recycled water system is amazing. So we have to think about this as a project that happens over a generation. And those smart investments made over a generation not only diversify our water portfolio and make us better able to handle uh, climate impacts, but also um, help make our communities more livable. And so this is a problem that we shouldn't be saying that the sky is falling. I think there are solutions for city and, and there are many opportunities for us to, uh, to build the systems that will mean that we would never be sitting back here at another meeting like this talking about uh, an insecure water system. Let me just pivot on that and ask you about what some of those systems might be. Because if you would have asked water leaders 30 years ago or 50 years ago about the new supply we were building for future generations, they'd say, I want to dam this river and that river and that river. Uh, and as you know, just about all the good rivers have already been dammed in California. There are a few that, that Governor Reagan and other people over the years put on the wild and scenic rivers list, but uh, there aren't that many places to build new dams on rivers anymore. Uh, what do you see when you talk about the supply we need to build over the next generation? What kind of things is that? Well, I could talk about three of them that I think are going to be the most important ones here in California. First, there's going to be water recycling. So if half of our indoor water use, half of our water use happens indoors, and we can recycle 80% of that water, that is, we can't get all the water and some of the water becomes concentrate that we have to dispose of, there's 30% of our water supply growing because we're, we're currently recycling a very small percentage of our urban wastewater. Then we have stormwater capture and recharge, and we're not talking here about bioswales and rain gardens and barrels off of people's roofs. We're talking about large-scale water capture systems to recharge aquifers, like what's being built in Burbank in the Sun Valley area, and systems that can uh, lead to many acre feet of water being recharged in a wet year mm -hmm. uh, to replenish aquifers in places like the Santa Clara Valley, Livermore Valley, and Sonoma. And finally, seawater desalination. And I know the mayor said that um, you know maybe we wait a little while, and I agree with him because seawater desalination is getting less and less expensive and less and less energy intensive every year. And so now we can look at Perth in Australia, where the climate underwent a fundamental change uh, due to some changes in the ocean currents. Perth is now getting about half of its drinking water from seawater desalination. Israel gets about half of its drinking water from seawater desalination. It's expensive, but it's, and it may be a last resort for us in California, but it's always there as a backstop. I guess that's the reason uh, I, I get emails and calls from people who say, if this gets really bad, will people just you know, abandon their homes and move to other places like in the Dust Bowl? And I tell them, we will never run out of water. 75% of the people live along the coast in California. It's the Pacific Ocean is a big ocean, and in emergencies, you can line that whole coast with plants. Now, you won't have, uh, in a 100-year drought, you won't have agriculture in the Central Valley much anymore, uh, but Silicon Valley and Hollywood and the, most of the economy would still be there. Um, Angela, let me ask you, uh, the Santa Clara Valley Water District is the, the water wholesaler for the county, of course, and you provide flood protection and, and water to 1.8 million people, and I think you have about 15 retailers. and you know, Cities and retailers. Cities and private companies. And um, talk about some of the main things that the district has done uh, to deal with the drought. Uh, just kind of what has worked and what hasn't worked so far. Okay, uh, so our district, uh, and, uh, and one of our board members is here today, our district was one of the first ones in, in, if you recall, going back to the beginning of last year, we went out before a lot of other agencies calling for 20% water use reduction. It is a short-term water use reduction measure. Um, but and this year, we upped it to 30%, a call for the entire county to conserve by 30%. Uh, along with that, we double some, a lot of our rebate programs. The most popular one is the turf replacement program, which uh, the mayor talked a little bit about, too. We're giving uh, residents and businesses $2 per square foot to rip out their turf and replace them with water-efficient landscaping. It's very successful in that in 2013, 160,000 square feet of turf uh, were replaced. Last year, because we upped the rebate, over a million square feet of turf uh, were replaced. 
This year, in the first, not even four months, we're approaching the one million square feet of turf replacement. That is saving us about 70 million gallons of water a year, and this is going to be a continuous saving in, in the long run. Um, so we talk, I want to talk a little bit about what isn't working so well. So the mm -hmm. glaring thing is we call for 20 percent, and we have 13 percent in this county, which is better than the California average. We're calling for 30 percent this year. The first three months of the year, we reached. Oh. Sorry, I don't know if I touched something. <laughs> Could be any of us. So in the first three months of this year, unfortunately, cumulatively, we only reached five percent. Now, that may not be such a dire uh, story because the high use months are yet to come. If we can get the water savings start to start in May, June, July, August, September, these high use months, we can, if we reach 30% in those months, we can still save a lot of water. And, and again, it's the groundwater basin that we're trying to protect. I definitely want to mention about this, this, uh, this project that the mayor talked about, that David talked a little bit about, the purify water. The district is in the forefront of this. In 2010, we started construction for an 8 million gallon a day purified water plant. In fact, we're giving a lot of tours. Uh, contact, contact me if you'd like to uh, get a tour of the facility. It's a wonderful facility. It uses highly proven technology to treat the water to basically drinking water standards, much like what Orange County is doing. We are in the process of accelerating that project to get uh, our current plant is 8 million gallons a day. We want to build a, a plant three times, four times the size on the same site. Take that waste, the treated wastewater that's already very clean, flowing out to the bay, and turn that into water that we can recharge into the groundwater basin, reuse. Great. Um, let me ask uh, Juliet about climate. You know, uh, <coughs> polls show that there's still some uh, public disagreement on climate change, although the, the scientific consensus from NOAA, NASA, World Meteorological Organization, Harvard, Stanford, all the places that study this is very, very clear. Um, and the 10 hottest years since modern records began back to 1880 have all occurred since 1998 in the, in the world. So the 10 hottest years have happened in the last 17 years. Um, and I guess my, my question to you is, there seems to be an actual debate among scientists about whether climate change is the cause of this drought. We've heard about the ridiculously resilient ridge, this giant bubble of high pressure over the Pacific that took all of our wet storms from the last few winters, pushed them up into Canada where they got cold, and that's why there was such incredible snow and freezing temperatures in Chicago and New York. You, all, you saw all those stories about how they, they were having the worst winters ever. It's because of what's been happening off the Pacific coast. And I guess I'm curious on your take whether those kind of factors, the, the, the warm ocean right now, the, this res resilient ridge, are caused by climate change or whether we would have been having this drought anyway. Right. Well, it, it made for difficult office politics because we're actually based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And so we were out in the sunny California office and they were literally, you know, walking through tunnels to get to work and, <laughs> and cursing us on our um, phone calls. But, you know, th there is a little, there is a debate that goes on in terms of using different models and different assumptions. And the NOAA reports and the Bulletin of the American Meteor Meteorological Society, different kinds of models using different assumptions have come to different conclusions. And they've come to con different conclusions about one thing, whether climate change is causing the lack of precipitation. And that is due in large part to the natural variability and gigantic variability in ocean cycles. What they have not disagreed on, and what there continues to be a scientific consensus around, is the warming. The climate change is causing higher temperatures and warming, and that spells trouble for California water for a variety of reasons. We've already talked about snowpack. As we get warmer temperatures, we have less snow, we have more rain, we have earlier snowmelts. That doesn't sound too bad, except for the fact that as we have earlier snow melt, that means that the spring runoff is coming earlier rather than later when demands are higher, our, you know, our hottest months are, are when we need that water. In addition, soil moisture, and Ellen brought that up in the beginning, soil moisture is uh, disappearing, evaporation, transpiration is requiring more water, so our water demand is going up. And water shortages are not just caused by lack of precipitation. They're caused by water demand outstripping water supply. And all of these changes that are due to a warming climate mean that we are 
widening that gap between water demand and water supply. By 2100, the, um, Dan Kayan and the others at Scripps Institute that have been doing a lot of this modeling have shown that we can expect if we stay on the current greenhouse gas global warming emissions scenarios, we're going to only have 75% of our snowpack remaining. That was um, presented in the beginning. The good news about that is, I mean, that's, that's pretty bad news if, if this is the ongoing um, cycles that we're dealing with. The good news is that we actually have control over this. If, if emissions, if we follow the lower emissions path, that reduction in snowpack, the model suggests, will be about half. And so really, a lot of this conversation that's happening around whether or not we can specifically um, you know, create a causal connection between lack of precipitation and, and climate change is missing the point that lowering greenhouse gas emissions, dealing with climate change now is one of the best ways that we can secure, secure water in the future and have a more reliable supply. So that's really the, the, the take home message um, in terms of what the scientific community agrees upon and um, you know, what we need to be doing. And it's interesting because uh, what Angela was saying earlier about the first couple of months of this year where people in this county only save 5%, uh, only conserve 5% uh, compared to prior years. The same thing happened in Southern California during the first few months of the year. They actually increased water use by 2% um, from the prior year. And the reason that a lot of the water directors told me was, look at what the weather was in January. It didn't rain a single day and it was 70 degrees in January. And everybody turned on their, their sprinklers. And they don't normally do that in January. And so, yeah, I think it, that's, that's an interesting uh, impact of heat there. Um, let me ask a public policy thing, and I'll start with you, uh, David. What do you think, you know, people have mentioned that, that, that Sacramento um, supported this water bond, Prop 1, that we voted for, the $7.5 billion bond uh, that, that voters approved in November. What are the two or three things that you think Sacramento should be doing, let's say this year in this session, the state legislature, uh, that they're not? That's a good question. And, and wearing a public policy hat at a PPIC meeting and coming from an engineering department is a little bit of a challenge. But I, I think the things that are on, on, <laughs> the things that are on my mind uh, are as follows. Um, first of all, I think that the economic damage associated from a drought only hits a city when it goes to severe water rationing and it curtails business activity. And, you know, people talk about how it could never get, if it got really bad, we would have water appropriated from agriculture coming into cities. I think it would help the cities and the business climate if we had a guarantee that it wouldn't come to that in a true emergency. And I think that would allow people to invest in the cities with a, a little bit more confidence. Um, another thing that I think that Sacramento could start doing is it's talking about something other than conservation, because all I hear about uh, our urban water system coming out of Sacramento these days is conserve, conserve, conserve. The technologies that are leading to this revolution in urban water systems came from an investment pipeline that was built 30, 30 40 years ago. So the seawater desalination plants that we see today are a result of investments made in the uh, Office of Saline Waters under President Kennedy. And that investment pipeline in new technologies for uh, water recycling, water reuse, and uh, even some of the conservation methods is empty. Mm -hmm. And that's because the federal investment in water systems is about uh, a tenth of what it was in the 1960s adjusted for inflation. And so if California views its, um, its economic security the same way the nation thinks about its uh, national security, this should be a project which demands the state's resources to create new solutions, not just to wait for others to provide them to us. So more money for research and more money for grants for things like I'm recycled water. Yeah, I'm an academic, I have to say that. No, but I, I, I do seriously mean it. I mean, we're, we're, we're willing to invest in, uh, in, in medicine and biotechnology at the state level. We're willing to invest in nanotechnology. We're willing to invest in all kinds of things that we see as critical for the state. This is a critical need for the state that supports our economy and many of the things that the people of California view as near and dear to them. And so waiting for the federal government to do it is a mistake. 
and waiting for other countries to develop the technology first is a mistake. So if it doesn't happen at the university, that's fine with me too. Yeah. But it's not something that's inherently profitable like information technology. It's about supporting the livelihood of the state. And sometimes that takes a little bit of the taxpayer's dollars to jumpstart. So demonstration yeah. projects, uh, research and development, um, all of those things are, are really integral for um, jumpstarting this innovation wave that we need. I've been to the construction site for the uh, $1 billion desal plant in San Diego. It's in Carlsbad. And um, uh, that's the largest desal plant ever built in North America. It's going to open this fall. And it's being built by Israeli engineers. Um, actually, I, before we move on here, I forgot to mention early on, you have a new book called Water 4.0. Could you very quickly tell us what the four phases of water are? Because I think that helps frame all of this. Well, this is the first place I can talk about that book, and I have to talk, don't have to say what 1.0, 2.0 means, right? Um, you guys right. all get that part. Um, the, the water system we have today is a result of three prior revolutions in urban water. Uh, the first revolution, imported water coming to us and allowing us to live at densities that surpass the ability of the local environment to provide us with water. The second water... Now, that started with the Romans, right? It's Romans. The aqueducts. And, and here locally, it's the, the Hetch Hetchy and McCullamy projects. I mean, those were revolutions yeah. because you wouldn't have a million people in San Francisco and, and a million people in the East Bay if you didn't have an imported water supply. The second revolution was drinking water treatment, which eliminated things like typhoid fever and cholera as concerns in our lifestyles. And so that was a revolution because it extended the lifetime of the average person in North America by about 15 years. Um, and the third revolution were our wastewater treatment plants that came out as a result of environmental concerns in the early 1970s in the Clean Water Act. And so within a 20-year period of the Clean Water Act passage, federal grants allowed us to upgrade our sewage treatment plants and have made our waters in most places fishable and swimmable again. And each of those revolutions had uh, existing technologies that made them possible, but it wasn't until society decided that the existing water system that we had was obsolete. And when we decided those systems were obsolete, in a period of 10 or 20 years, we revolutionized our water system. So the fourth revolution in urban water, the thing I talked about at the beginning of the meeting today, is happening around the world. It's happening in pockets. It's happening in Southern California and Orange County. It's happening in Singapore. It's happening in Australia and Israel. And that's our future ahead of us. And I think that that's what the book tries to lay out so we can see this as just another one of those phases in an, a, a series of urban water revolutions. Great. Um, so Juliet, uh, what should Sacramento be doing that it's not? Well, I mean, I think that David covered the innovation side of things really well. Um, I would say that um, at some point, you know, 10 years down, the, if, we have, if this drought continues, um, our system of prior appropriation will probably at least start coming under more scrutiny. So much of the water that's allocated in the state is allocated in first in time, first in right. So if your ancestors or your city had Pueblo rights, uh, was there first, you still you have more secure rights. And what that does is it really creates a pretty uneven playing field. Um, for instance, this year you've heard about the massive cutbacks to agriculture, and that's true. Um, in most cases, they're getting 0% of their uh, Central Valley project allocations. However, there are some con contractors, they are senior water rights holders that will get 75% of their allocation, and they have gotten 100% of their allocation in, in past dry years. So this really, um, this system, you know, obviously doesn't, doesn't share the pain equally. Some people are hit really hard, other people are not hit at all. And in Australia, for example, which had their millennial drought, a 10-year drought, they started looking at their water rights system and really thinking about um, how to rationalize it to make sure that water, well, the water rights that are given are proportional to availability. So that you, that you know what water rights you have. First, you have to figure out how much water rights people have, and then that you're not promising water that doesn't exist. And what we call that in the trade is paper water. And there's a lot of paper water out there. That's water that, um, you know, when they thought that the whole state water project was going to be built and it, it, some of the final pieces of infrastructure were not built um, for earthquake reasons and environmental reasons, um, we, we just have given out more rights than there is actually wet water. 
So by making that transition to start thinking about how do we really deal with an antiquated water rights system and bring it into modern times, it's actually the first step that you need to take in order to even start talking about a water market. And that's something that's come up quite a bit in the state. Um, but really understanding water rights and making sure that water rights are rational and that they're not paper water, those are, those are preliminary steps to any kind of market-based solution. Got it. Angela. OK. Uh, well, actually, the first thing I want to say is uh, I think uh, Sacramento did do something right, which is the governor. The governor came out early last year asking all Californians to cut back their water use by 20%. This year, he upped it to 25%, and he's got a whole slew of rules. And, and you heard Mayor Licato talk about fining water agencies $10,000 a day for if they don't meet their targets. So I think there's, there's a number of things the governor is doing right. And what we like to see is actually the governor being on the front page of newspapers and news outlets because with his position comes attention. And we need attention on this drought until the drought is over. Um, I do want to uh, talk about the, the one thing that we, we want to see Sacramento do. And, and again, I, I think Mayor Licato actually talked about a lot of things that I, I think of the same thing which is CEQA exemption for recycled water projects. This project that we're trying to accelerate to put water, purify water into the ground, it's a project that's already been done elsewhere in, in here in California, Orange County. So we think there should be some kind of accelerated CEQA process to get these projects uh, into, the, into the ground and get the water here. Um, the other thing we want to see is, so we're pursuing this project for indoor potable reuse because those are the only regulations that are out there available for us to use. But well, we want to see policies advancing potable reuse, including direct potable reuse, which is taking water that you, you purify in this fashion and uh, send it to the raw water blend to a treatment plant and further treat it and send it out to, to consumers. Mm -hmm. um, we have time for one more question for the panel, and then we're going to take your questions. Uh, this is just a basic one that I'm sure a lot of you hear all the time. Uh, what are a couple of your favorite tips that you tell people if they want to know how they can save water more at their house and reduce their water bill and make a, make a contribution to the drought. Um, we'll start with you, Angela. All right. Um, I did bring some uh, water conservation uh, handouts, so please, uh, if you haven't had a chance to pick up some, uh, some fact sheets there. One of the things, uh, I mentioned the turf replacement program. Really, I know a lot of people don't actually like to mow their lawns, so I think <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. It's a win-win solution. Uh, you save a lot of water, and you don't have to work that hard to keep your lawn uh, looking nice. Uh, the other thing is So wait, wait, don't mow your lawn. Uh, so well, that's what you're saying? I actually, um, not quite, but brown is the new Oh, let, it, let your lawn brown. die, you're saying. OK. <laughs> well, not quite die. Um, Brown is a new green is a slogan that we came up with in 2014. Yeah. In fact, it was fascinating to see East Bay Parks with the same sign, but their color is slightly different. So I know it, <laughs> our design is slightly different. But we have these lawn signs. Pick up one from us. What it actually tells you is your lawn, you think your lawn needs to be green to be alive. Indeed, your lawn can be brown and still be alive. You can water twice a week and the lawn is still alive. What you do is you push on the, on the grass. If it bounces back, the, the lawn is still alive. So you can, if you really, really love lawns and you can't let it go, well, you know, you can still keep it alive, but it will be brown. But put that sign on so your neighbors will not think that you're just not doing your part to keep up with the neighborhood. You're actually doing something uh, for the drought. Uh, the other thing I want to briefly mention is that you know, uh, people are still going to want to have some kind of outdoor landscaping. Well, drip irrigation is the way to go. It's so much more water efficient. It goes directly into the plants that need that water. Overhead sp uh, sprinklers, the, especially the old ones, they waste so much water. So just simple things you can do. Convert it to, uh, maybe it's not so simple, but convert it to drip irrigation if you can. If you can convert it right away, high efficiency sprinklers. And by the way, we have uh, rebates. If you live in this county, contact us. We do put our money where our mouth is. We're giving out a lot of rebates. Washing machines are not all alike. If you run a commercial uh, washer where it's a lot of, it gets a lot of uses, uh, it, can be, it can be a lot of water safe. Um, um, I, I recently myself heard of, heard of this new thing, which is a pint flush urinal. So if anybody is putting in a new building and you're putting in urinals, there's actually something called pint flush. It takes a pint of water instead of a gallon of water. So over time, it saves a lot. I want to uh, give a plug to one of my uh, neighbor agencies, San Francisco PUC. 
Uh, I haven't visited this building, but I heard about it. It's, there, it's the headquarters for San Francisco PUC. It's in downtown San Francisco. And they built it to be a very new building. So all the water from the sinks, from the toilet flushing, goes down to the basement where they actually have a process that purifies our water, not to drinking standards, but it comes back to flush toilets again. So the concept of you don't use your very clean, fresh water only once, and it goes down the drain is, is waste. It's, you reuse that water several times. I also have flyers about gray water systems. So I think all of these things teach people to understand their water footprint much like they understand their energy footprint. Energy is not even something you can see. And these days, we have such understanding of our energy footprint to some degree, the cars that we drive, our choices. I think it's so, we have a way to get people to really understand their water footprint, and that's where we want to get people to. Great. Uh, Julia, your tip for folks. Um, so I'm wondering how many people here know about the public goods charge on electricity? Somebody, do you know how much it is? Okay, so what I'm going to suggest is that you all support a public goods charge for water. And I'll tell you why, because you don't even know how much your public goods charge is for electricity and you've been paying it. <laughs> So it, it's less than a cent per kilowatt hour. And what that has done is driven massive efficiencies and innovation on the electricity side. And really what we're talking about, and a lot of PPIC reports have highlighted this, is that we have a really unsustainable funding model for the water sector, um, in particular parts of the water sector especially. But right now, all of the things we're asking water agencies to do we're asking them to be at the forefront of innovation. We're asking them to co help conserve water, which actually, if they haven't decoupled their rates from sales, then that's going to reduce their, their revenue. Um, all that stuff co costs money and needs research and, research and development and needs demonstration projects. Um, we have a successful model. It's worked on the energy side. Applying it to the water side, there hasn't been a lot of support. There hasn't been support from the customers and they, they haven't been asking their water utilities to go along with it. So the utilities are afraid to be at the forefront on, on a public goods charge. If you can you know, go home, write letters, tell your water supplier that you really believe in a very small public goods surcharge, that can really go a long way um, in terms of helping drive innovation in this field and help make your water more secure. David, your home tip. Well, I, I would be tempted to say here, you know, come on over to my house and see my salvia and herbs growing in the garden with the drip irrigation or my space age toilet and all those things. But you guys already all do that. You're the kind of people who care about water. So my message to you for doing something different to save water is stop demonizing your neighbors who um, think that they need a lawn because that, that confrontation of pe telling people who live in communities that have a lot of sprawl that they should kill their lawn is not always productive. There are technologies out there, uh, smart irrigation systems that rely upon soil moisture centers and weather forecasting. There are different species of grass that can be grown. And there are landscaping options that look more like the ground cover that makes sense in places where the lots are widely distributed. Um, that may be attractive to folks living out there. And I think that, you know, we have to have a discussion, but we have to recognize that the communities that are using a lot of water outdoors um, look fundamentally different than San Francisco and Berkeley and downtown San Jose and Palo Alto. And we have to provide attractive options for them because I'm just hard pressed to imagine uh, the people in Black Hawk and Dublin putting wood chips on those great big half acre lots. So we can encourage dense uh, development and smart transit, but we have to also start thinking about uh, what the alternatives are in the interim. And so I think in Southern California, where if you go to Orange County, the lawns are plenty green now, um, and, and people would push back pretty hard if you told them they had to kill their lawns. But there are ways to save close to 50% of outdoor water use just by going to better irrigation control and better technology. So it's, it's certainly conservation for people who are uh, amenable to conservation. And in a time of drought, I actually like the idea of having some lawns because that really gives you your last cushion before you have to do true economic damage by telling restaurants to use paper plates and telling businesses that they can't go out and do construction projects. So I don't mind a few lawns out there, but we can make them a lot more efficient just with technology. Great. 
Okay, uh, some questions from, from the audience. Uh, why don't I start over here? Yes, sir. We heard a lot about how uh, the drought is affecting the agriculture industry and will continue in the future, most likely. I'm curious if there are any industries in and around San Jose, water intensive industries like chip manufacturing and so forth, that could be affected or even eventually displaced if, if these sorts of conditions continue or worsen. Anybody? I'm actually happy to take that. Okay. Since I represent a lot of those businesses. Yes. So, yeah, I was on a, Mike Milkey with the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. So I was on a state level um, uh, group that was looking at best management practices. And we actually don't do much manufacturing in Silicon Valley anymore. Um, there's a number of reasons for that. Um, so we do boutique manufacturing, R&D, uh, that kind of stuff. So um, we're not heavy industrial users here. So it's not as critical an issue as, as it is in other parts of the state. Um, other questions? Uh, Peter. I get asked a lot about pharmaceutical waste in advanced purified water. Is that an issue, or does reverse osmosis take care of everything for potable reuse? Um, I presume that's a question for me. I've been studying it for close to 20 years now, and what I can tell you is um, I'm not very worried about pharmaceuticals and drugs. I think the public is titillated by the idea that the antibiotics uh, in urine could make it back to the water supply. But I think if you did the calculation, you would think that the, the residue you get on your finger when you take the drugs is probably a larger dose. There are That said, there are some things in purified recycled water that we're concerned about. And that comes from the research we've done in Orange County and Singapore and elsewhere. We see low molecular weight neutral compounds that can go through reverse osmosis membranes. And those are not the pharmaceuticals. Those are often solvents. And so we see uh, solvents from commercial and industrial activities, things like 1,4-dioxane uh, and acetone and uh, NDMA and nitrosodimethylamine. Uh, those are the things that we've detected after reverse osmosis, and luckily, the second barrier in the system, the UV peroxide system, takes care of it. So these are the same sorts of things that we worry about in effluent-dominated surface waters, like uh, many of our surface water drinking plant, uh, water treatment plants use. But um, we have an antiquated system of industrial and commercial source control in America, where we essentially use our sewers as a disposal point for industry. And the regulations on those industrial treatment plants are essentially designed to prevent you from knocking out the bacteria in the sewage treatment plant with a toxic shock of chemicals. Now that our sewage treatment plants are our drinking water supply, we have to treat them differently. Like if you live in a house with a septic tank, there are things you don't put down the septic tank. In this era of water recycling, which we're already doing well beyond Orange County, for example, if you live in Houston, Texas, and you drink water out of Lake Livingston, which is the main reservoir, half of that water came from the sewers of Dallas and Fort Worth. So it's happening everywhere around the country already. But we have to rethink what we put down the sewer because it finds its way into our water supply. And that's particularly important when it comes to commercial and industrial waste. I think just one comment. The, the water that goes into Lake Livingston has not been through a purified water process. So that has all the pharmaceuticals. That has everything in it. So once the, it goes through the purified water process, it knocks out all the big chain um, types of things like pharma. Pharma gets knocked out during the RO process. And as he highlighted, the rest of the process takes care of all the other known things that we know. So that's much better than what we have going on today. You already drink recycled water. You just don't know it. It comes from Sacramento. Yeah, Sacramento's uh, sewage treatment plant goes into the Sacramento River, which goes into the Delta, which goes into our taps. Okay, um, John, you had a question. Oh, I'm sorry, Angela, do you want to add anything to that? Well, I, I just want to add that uh, when we built this 8 million gallon a day facility, we also intended for it to be a demonstration study go going towards potable reuse. So we actually have an ongoing uh, demonstration study going on right now. We do understand that, to answer Peter's question, we, we, we see the same thing. Certain things do pass through RO, but this UV uh, advanced oxidation state does uh, address those things. And there, there's, uh, there's also technology of using ozone and biological filtration to remove some of the same things. When you don't need to remove salt, that's another mechanism that, that can address the same kind of concerns. John. 
Thank you. Um, my question is uh, the, regarding the rates conservation nexus. Uh, as you know, when you conserve, the rates don't go down. And uh, my question is how, how much of a focus should we, and that's a collective we, whether it's a utility, the Public Policy Institute, you know, the water district, how much of that should we be focusing on? And um, what are some of the ways that you have on uh, ideas that we can effectively communicate that? Well, I guess I brought it up, so I'll say something about it. I mean, it's gotten a little bit more complicated over the last two days. <laughs> so it, this is a, um, a court case was decided that um, basically in the city of San Juan Capistrano, they found that their tiered water rates violated Proposition 218, which is a voter approved initiative that passed in the 90s um, that limits the property related fees and requires a cost of service nexus. So you can't charge more than it actually costs to deliver water. And that, in, I think the governor put it well when he said that straight jackets water providers. Um, it becomes really hard to use pricing as a signal to drive behavior. And we know that it is an important way that people respond um, to telling them that this is a scarce resource. Um, so it's going to become probably harder before it becomes easier. Uh, we were talking actually before this panel started about drought surcharges or some kind of drought rate that um, might be legislatively allowed to be exempt from Proposition 218. No idea if that would actually work, but um, finding ways to allow water utilities to be innovative is very important. And unfortunately, a lot of our um, voter approved initiatives have gone in the opposite direction in recent, recent years. Um, one thing that, that was mentioned at the very beginning was decoupling. And investor-owned utilities like Cal Water are regulated by the California Public Utilities Commission, and they are allowed to, like the electricity sector, um, have a water rate adjustment mechanism. So they can um, determine what, what amount of their loss in sales was related to conservation efforts and then recoup that in, on future bills. Um, that hasn't really been uh, applied to the public sector uh, as, as much. It's, it's much more difficult in water because we have thousands of public utilities that are regulated by publicly elected boards. And on the energy side, you have like basically three big investor-owned utilities that are all regulated by the CPUC. So that makes regulation easier on that side. Um, so I think it, there's going to be a lot of experimentation over the next few years, and I'm sorry I don't have like the perfect answer, but uh, it's definitely an area that I know a lot of people are thinking about. And the, the Prop 218 case that you mentioned, uh, it could be picked up by the state Supreme Court, uh, so the, the law might change again. We've also heard the Howard, Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association say they're going to start going after individual districts who already have rates in place that they think uh, don't uh, comply with Prop 218. So uh, as one state Brown administration lawyer told me, it's going to be house to house trench warfare for a while. I think your question was a little bit more about how you communicate that to the public. Mm -hmm. And so um, at the PPIC launch a few weeks ago, I went up and um, made a pest of myself to the editorial page editor of the San Francisco Chronicle because they had written an article complaining about why water rates go up when people use less water. And she called my bluff and asked me to write a viewpoint piece. And so last Sunday I wrote a viewpoint piece in the Chronicle. And I, I think it, it highlights this, this need for utilities not to be the ones out there defending these rates because they seem like they have a, a self-serving interest in, in this issue. And I think that someone has to point out that Part of the reason why we didn't achieve those conservation goals last year is that utilities don't like it when their revenues come down quickly when people start conserving. So if cities want their utilities to be partners in water conservation measures, they have the carrot and the stick. So we heard about the stick of $10,000 a day fines. The carrot is politicians and business leaders coming to their aid 
and also messaging the public and telling them that water is not a commodity that you buy by the gallon. It's a service that is provided to all the people that live in the city, and we have to find different ways to share it. And so it's a question of kind of a partnership between utilities and cities and business leaders to find a solution and not setting them up as adversaries. Because the last year, I think it's one of the things that caused the utilities to drag their feet in pushing conservation messages. Mm -hmm. We're Can I add one more thing to that? Yeah, Which is Real quick, and then we have time yeah. for one final question. Go yeah, ahead. just that there's often a real misunderstanding of water rates versus water bills. So for I'm an East Bay Municipal Utility District customer. My water rates have increased. My water bill has decreased because I've done things to reduce my water use. So again, making that, just communicating clearly that water bills can go down in under a conservation-oriented rate structure I think is also really important. Great. Any final Questions? Uh, nobody asked anything about the media. I don't know if you have a, a media question about how the press is covering this, whether you think it's a bad job or a good job, but I'm always happy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you asked you know, we, did, we dish it out. We hardly ever take it. So I always tell people I'll answer any questions about the press. Dick. No, no question. It's just a comment. We can't make it without the press. And uh, just, there was an article of the day about one of your new reporters here in Mercury News. I forgot the name. I called him immediately and said thank you and got no call back. Mm. But he actually listed all the ways of cutting and reducing water. Yeah. Go back to David. I'm all for innovation and technology. But in the meantime, water conservation is a way of life. No matter we solve the problem tomorrow. I remember years ago when this trash recycling first came out. Mm -hmm. My dad was from the old system. Oh, we don't need this stuff and so on. Mm -hmm. Those are 20, 40 years ago. Today, don't we have pride when we have our trashes this much and our recycling is like that? It's the same for water. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Good. And we've reduced uh, garbage going to landfills by 75% in this city in the last 25 years. Remember we always used to hear about how we're running out of landfill space? Almost never hear that anymore. There's actually a lot of environmental problems that have been solved, but nobody gets paid to tell you things are getting better. So. Uh, <laughs> I often try to do that, but uh, I've been sidelined by the drought in the last few years. Uh, we have uh, a final uh, speaker here to close out. Uh, Mike Milkey is Vice President for Environmental Programs and Policy at the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. Uh, he works to advance state and federal policy related to climate change mitigation and adaptation, and also works on corporate environmental sustainability, uh, water quality, and a lot of other issues. So um, please join me in thanking our panel and in welcoming Mike. So uh, thanks for that gracious introduction, Paul. I'm very aware that I'm standing between you and your weekend. It is a Friday afternoon, and it is a really nice day. Um, it's actually kind of weird, isn't it, that this spring's been cooler than the winter was, right? Um, anyway, um, just two things that I have as sort of my wrap up for this. Um, first, and it's made so much easier by the fact that it's such a great panel that was here, by the way, just really fantastic and great job of moderating that, that discussion, Paul, and for setting it all up, uh, Ellen. Um, so the first order of business is outside, as soon as I'm done talking, in about a minute here, there's some refreshments. So please go help yourself and, and network uh, as you make your way to your weekends. And then the last thing I'd like to say is, I just heard so much as, as what we do is on policy. I heard so many areas of opportunity for advancing policy. And you know, part of what I do is on climate change, uh, both the mitigation and adaptation piece, uh, and then more and more now on, on water. And I think the state's done a really good job, and it hasn't been easy, but a really good job of creating the, the, the enabling environment to advance clean energy. And, and that, what can we learn from what the state's done in that space, and how can we translate that into water because as David I think did a great job of, of outlining for us there's so many opportunities for next generation practices and technologies in that space and so uh, the leadership group looks forward to working with um, a number of folks on advancing advancing the right kind of policy here in the state and so with that I'll just I'll just say have a great weekend and thanks for coming <laughs>